Well, thank you, George. It's so good to see lots of different people from different parts of the world, not just parts of Australia. So welcome. But uh, I know it means very little to you if you're from another nation, but I'm pretty excited tonight because I am actually speaking from our city campus in Sydney. And this is the first time I've been in this building since March this year. So I'm pretty excited about that. And we have a number of people that hopefully you can hear as I'm speaking who are from our city campus, members of the team and different, uh, different people. So, so good to be here with you. Well, it's my awesome privilege to speak to you tonight. And I believe I've got a message that can help every single one of you, whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance, whether this has been a reasonable year for you or a terrible year for you, I believe this message is going to speak right into your situation and circumstance. All right, before I start, and I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into the message, I want to pose two questions. And I want you to think about these questions and I'm going to give you the answer to these questions a little later in the message. These are the two questions. Why do the Jewish nation sing Psalm 103 every year on the Day of Atonement? Let me say that again. Why do the Jewish nation sing Psalm 103 every year on the Day of Atonement. Second question, why are Orthodox priests, priests in the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church, why are they required to read Psalm 103 every day of their lives? What is it about Psalm 103 that is so important? All right, with those two questions in mind, I'm going to pray and then we're going to get right into this short message for that person who said that this was, uh, was worried about the length of message. This is just going to be a short message. Don't panic. Listen up. If necessary and if possible, take notes because this is going to help you in your future. And can I just say this? I've said this many times during this season. If you get have an aha moment, a revelation moment throughout this message, put it on the chat. Say, ah, I got that. Or write down the statement that I've just said that hit your spirit because it'll act as a sort of confession for you. Help it get into your spirit. So let's pray that God speaks to every single one of you, whatever your situation or circumstance. Father God, I thank you for these wonderful people who are joining from our city campus here in Sydney and other parts of the world. I pray, Father, that you will speak to each one in their situation, whatever their story, whatever their narrative. I pray that you would speak to each one and make this message relevant to their lives in your name. And everybody said in all your various settings, Amen, Amen and our men. Well, in 1639, a man by the name of John Clark wrote a book on Latin and English proverbs. And in it, he included this proverb, which many of you will have heard before. Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That simple statement is probably one of the oldest definitions and formulas for well being. And it includes wellness in body, wellness in soul, and wellness in spirit. It includes two steps early to bed and early to rise, and it has three outcomes makes you healthy, wealthy, and wise. But here's the question. Is it true? And if it is, is it biblical? What is the actual biblical basis for well-being? Now, I'm going to explain what well-being is and how we get it 
But before I do, let me establish this. Well-being is something that God wants for each one of you. It's not just us desiring it. God wants you to be in a position of well-being. He wants you to experience well-being. Here it says in Psalm 35, verse 27, May those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, The Lord be exalted. Listen to this. Who delights in the well-being of His servant. God delights in your well-being. Now, obviously, in this difficult and challenging season, well-being has been front and center in our discussions and in our thinking. Many people have really struggled through this year. In fact, I did a quick Google search of the subject of well-being, and I came across a number of lists, eight dimensions of well-being, six aspects of well-being, five ways to well-being, four pillars of well-being, three steps to well-being. And in each of these situations, like the proverb that I've just quoted to you, it requires us to do something. If you want well-being, you've got to do this. Well, Jesus turned that idea on its head. As normal human beings, we want to be in control. We want to be in control of our own destiny. We want to think that we are the people that are going to make life happen for us. And that was exactly the same for the disciples. They said to Jesus in John chapter 6 and verse 28, What must we do to do the works of God? Here they are doing just what we always do. What must we do to do the works of God? What must we do to be in well-being? And Jesus answered like this, The work of God is this, to believe in the one He sent. The work of God is this, to believe in the one He sent. In other words, it's not about what you and I do to gain well-being. It is what He, Jesus Christ, has done. So if you want a, mess- a title to this message, if you're taking notes on your phone or your, your iPad or whatever it is that you have, write this down. His well-doing, our well-being. His well-doing, our well-being. Now, before I answer the two questions about Psalm 103, let me talk to you about three mistakes that we make about well-being. Because in order to learn what we need to do, we need to unlearn what we shouldn't do. In fact, recently our senior pastor, Brian Houston, not only talked about changing your thinking in order to gain well-being, but he also talked about what we need to unlearn. So I think it's a good idea to look at the mistakes we make. And then we're going to answer the question about Psalm 103. But first, turn to Psalm 42, which talks about our mistakes. It also talks about some solutions. Psalm 42, verse 3. This is one of my favourite psalms. It's been a lifeline to me. It says this, My tears have been food, my food day and night, when people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God. That's a, that's a relevant verse right there. We used to go to the house of God at the beginning of this year, but many of us haven't been able to go to the house of God recently. We used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. I don't know what it's like where you are if you're in a different nation, but we're not allowed to sing in Australia. We can have a few people gathered, but we're not allowed to sing, which is exactly the situation 
of this person. Whoever the Psalmist is, they're going through a tough time, they're downcast, they're depressed, their well-being is shattered. And they remember, I used to go to the house of God with enthusiasm, with passion, with excitement. And now I'm being criticised from everybody. They're saying, where's your God in these circumstances? Just like we are being criticised at the moment. Where's your God in the middle of this pandemic? Can you see the uh, uh, similarities between your situation and this Psalmist? And then he says this, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast, therefore I will remember you. All right, now it looks as though he's done all the right things, but I want to turn it on its head and look at three mistakes he made initially, three mistakes that you and I make all the time. Firstly, here's the first mistake. We think our happiness is based on circumstances. So the first point is our happiness is misunderstood. We think that if we have things, if everything's going well, we're feeling good, we've got a nice house, we've got a car, we've got good food, we've got friends, things are going according to plan, that makes us happy. And that's exactly what this psalmist said. He said, uh, my, I used to go to the house of God. In other words, he was looking at when the circumstances were better and saying, that made me happy, but now that has been taken from me. I am not happy. And isn't that what we do? Things have gone wrong. We've had a horrible year. But your happiness is not dependent on your circumstances. He began to understand this. And then he said, all right then, I choose to praise God. I will praise Him, my Saviour and my God. And that's what the prophet Habakkuk did in Habakkuk 3 and verse 17. Though the fig tree doesn't bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive tree crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stores, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Saviour. In other words, it's got nothing to do with the circumstances. God is the same and He's always worthy to be praised. All right, so here's the second mistake. Our hope is misplaced. Here, this psalmist is saying, people are saying to me all day long, where's your God? And we tend to place our hope in people. We tend to place our hope in leaders. And then we get upset when leaders fail, when people let us down. And social media starts attacking us from all sides. But my hope is not placed in social media. My hope is not placed in other people. My hope is not placed in leaders. My hope is placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is unchangeable from today, yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I haven't got time to read it, but have a read of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 onwards. It says, by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for, to, for God to lie, His promise and His oath, He made the unchanging nature of His purpose clear to the heirs of what was promised. God is unchangeable. And then it goes on to say, we have this hope as an anchor to the soul. We put our hope in Jesus. We put our hope in what Jesus has done. And that's what this psalmist did. He said, I put my hope in God. And my hope is not in the vaccine. My hope is not in the government. My hope is not in the leaders. My hope is not in the congregation. My hope is in Jesus. So the psalmist made three mistakes and then rectified the mistakes. Firstly, he thought his happiness was dependent on circumstances. Secondly, he thought his hope was in people. So thirdly, this is the third mistake. Our hope is misled, sorry, our heart is misled. What do I mean by that? 
Well, we allow our body and our soul to rule our spirit. We actually say, we talk about we are body, soul, and spirit, when the Bible actually says we are spirit, soul, body. We shouldn't be ruled by our flesh or our feelings, nor should we be ruled by just our thinking. We are ruled by our spirit. And this is what this man came up with. He said, my tears have been my food day and night. He was being led by his feelings. But then he says, I choose to remember God. Lamentation 3 says exactly the same. Verse 19, uh, Jeremiah the prophet, he says, I remember the affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast. When you and I remember the wrong things, things go horribly wrong. And then he says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. How cool is that? He made a decision. I will remember God. I will remember God. So can I just ask you, Have you made the same mistakes? Have you misled your spirit, your heart? Have you allowed your body or your soul to tell your spirit how to behave? In this psalmist, he said, his spirit took control. He said to his soul, soul, why are you downcast? Get, I'm paraphrasing here from the original Hebrew. Get your act together. Sort yourself out. I'm not going to do what my body says. I'm going to do what my spirit says. All right. So those are the three mistakes. But what's this got to do with Psalm 103? Why do they sing it on the Day of Atonement? Because they're remembering what God has done for them. That's what the Day of Atonement is all about. He forgives us our sins. They remember what God has done. They understand that their well-being is based on His well-doing. And then the reason that the Orthodox priests say this verse or this psalm every week is that we tend to forget what God has done. So we need to choose to remember. All right, here it is. This is what we Or if you're an Orthodox priest, you're required to read every day. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Notice, same thing. He's challenging his soul. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Here He is choosing to remember the same as Psalm 42. And then it goes through five things that God has done. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Now, if you're the sort of person like most of us are who want to do something, well, here's something you can do. Remember what God has done. Read this each morning. Uh, These five things speak to my well-being. Let's quickly go through them. Firstly, He forgives my sins. And because Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ has cancelled my debt, I am free. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. God has cancelled my debt. This is what it says in Colossians 2.13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us and He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, I want you to get an image here. I want you to think about this. Imagine if I took a big old school blackboard and I wrote in chalk 
every single sin that you had ever committed. All your sins. I mean, it's going to be a pretty long list. This is a big blackboard. That is the image that Paul the Apostle is talking about. He calls this your debt. And you cannot pay it. You cannot pay it. But then in this verse that I've just read, he uses three verbs, three things. Firstly, God cancelled the debt. In other words, He crossed it out. Then He uses a second verb. He wiped it clean. Then He uses the third word. He took it away and destroyed it. In other words, He didn't just wipe the sins off your life. He broke the board on which they were written. I'm free. It doesn't matter what has happened this year. I am free. That's good for your well-being right there. Not me, it's what God has done. But He didn't just forgive my sins. Number two, He healed our sicknesses. 1 Peter 2, 24, He bore Himself, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds, we have been healed. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, I don't know about you, but I've been sick and my friend has been sick. Hey, the word for healing in the Greek, in the original, is much more than just physical healing. It is made whole. So when it says, he who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, that word is made whole. God has made you whole. It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter even if you have been sick. Tragically, we live in a broken world where people get sick and worse, they die. And until God restores all things, that will be our reality. But in the meantime, I'm gonna confess, not only am I free, but I have been made whole. I've been complete in Christ. And that suddenly changes your well-being. But He doesn't just free me. He doesn't just make me whole. He, number three, redeems my life. Look at what it says. He heals all my sicknesses and redeems my life. Listen to this. 1 Peter 1.18, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Jesus, a lamb without blemish or defect. Can I just say this? You may not feel valuable at this time, but God thought you were worth enough to send His Son to die for you. The blood of Jesus Christ purchased you, bought you back from slavery and put a value on your life. You are valuable. Many years ago, Graham Kendrick wrote uh, an amazing song. And he said this, Would you say that you are worth what it cost him? You say no, but the price stays the same. If it doesn't make you cry, laugh it off, pass it by. But just remember the day when you throw it away that he paid what he thought you were worth. The cross of Christ has says that I am free. The wounds of Christ say that I'm whole. The blood of Christ say that I'm valuable. Two more. He crowns our head. He crowns our head. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I am loved. Maybe you've messed up. I've messed up. People around me have messed up. But God has demonstrated His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, He died for us. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. That'll change your well-being. 
So can you see, I could go through formulas. I could say early to bed, early to rise, and it will make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. But actually, that isn't the secret to well-being. The secret to well-being is His well-doing. He forgives your sins. He heals your sicknesses. He redeems your life. He crowns you with love. And finally, He satisfies your desires. Satisfies your desires. Look at this, Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Oh yeah, we live in a troubled world. We live in a world filled with anxiety. People are concerned about next year, what's gonna happen tomorrow. But I have peace, not because I'm special, but because I've put my trust in what Jesus has done. My well-being is based on His well-doing. Let me just summarise and I'm going to read it because I want you to really get this. I praise God despite the circumstances. I place my hope in God who cannot change. And then I remember what God has accomplished for me. The cross of Christ says I am free. The wounds of Christ say I am whole. The blood of Christ says, I am valued. The death of Christ says, I am loved. And the Spirit of Christ says, I have peace. My well-being, your well-being is assured because of what Jesus has done. So as I draw this to a conclusion, may I ask you a question wherever you are, whatever your situation, Let me ask you, have you a real, personal relationship with Christ? Are you relying on yourself for your own well-being, your future, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations? Or are you putting your trust in Jesus? Have you asked Him to come into your life? Because when you do, He comes into your life and changes you. He does what you cannot do. He heals you, forgives you turns your life upside down. All you've got to do is put Him in charge. Call Him Lord, Lord, call Him King, call Him Master, but put Him in charge. Are you prepared to do that? I'm going to pray a prayer right now. And if you just pray this prayer with me, this could be the first step, not just in your future life with Jesus, but the first step to real well-being. Why don't you say with me this prayer? Oh Lord Jesus Christ, Thank you that today I realise I need you. I choose to put my trust in you. Please come into my life. Do what I cannot do. Turn my life around. Forgive me. From this day, I put my trust in you. My well-being is dependent on your well-doing. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Give yourself a clap. Fantastic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to George and Nathan. But before I do that, can I just say that was a great prayer to pray. And can I just encourage you, if you prayed that prayer, put in the chat, I prayed that prayer. And that's going to be the first step in your journey of blessing and freedom and recovery. And... Uh, So good. And for the rest of us, why don't we have a look at Psalm 103 each morning and put our trust and our hope, not in our circumstances, but in Jesus. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.